Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going, going, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. We're with you for the next half hour to zoom you through space in the oblivion of today's world, like a rocket full of remains that's about to miss the moon. We'll explain that later. You're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Yes, you're referring to that rocket that doesn't look like it's going to make it to the moon because it's run out of power because its solar panels have gone wrong. Uh, so uh, not much of a space mission, I'd say. It's a uh, mad story, but we are covering we'll get it. Back. So let's we'll, not, we'll, let's we'll, not spoil uh, the surprise. We'll get that uh, to that later on. And now we're going to rocket through the news at a million miles an hour. So first up, uh, Ed Davey uh, calls for him to resign. He's called, uh, over the past couple of years, he's called for no fewer than 34 people to resign uh, and uh, called for Boris Johnson to resign as Prime Minister 18 times. Well, Ed... A lot of people think it's time for you to resign. Uh, he is now accusing all post office senior managers of uh, unleashing a conspiracy of lies. It, it, it's extraordinary. Appa yeah, apparently, I... apparently, it's absolutely not the post, uh, post office minister's fault at the time, Sir Ed Davies. Nothing to do with him because everybody lied to him. He's innocent. It, what I find staggering about this, and actually what is quite tragically emblematic about this, uh, is the fact that he said, well, look, when uh, I phoned the civil service to say, well, do I, is there something here? Do I need to look into this? The civil service went, nah, nothing to see here. Don't, don't, don't go and meet the sub postmasters. No, 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 no. They're, they're just making it up. And th was he so busy? Was there other things in his in tray, other fires to be putting out at the post office, that he decided not to investigate this. And it's just, you know, it, it smacks of how the world works today, when ordinary people say to politicians, this is what we want you to do. This is how we want you to represent us. We pay for you. We got you into power. You were elected by us. And the civil service have better ideas. And the politicians go, oh, well, civil service says no. I, I mean, come on, this is supposed to be a democracy, not he's a quangocracy. The, he's the minister in charge of the post office at the time. Hundreds of sub postmasters are saying to him, There's something wrong here. We didn't do anything wrong. This looks like the computer. Hundreds of them are telling him. And uh, when Alan Bates, who of course is the sort of star of uh, Mr. Bates versus the post office, the ITV drama that has triggered this massive response, we should have responded as a nation much earlier to this, but TV drama is powerful. Now everyone is in a real lather. Now, when Alan Bates asked for a meeting, uh, Ed Davey told him, uh, he can see no useful purpose for that. And for that, Ed, you are in trouble. And uh, it's not surprising that the Tories are going to weaponize Ed's uh, administration of this scandal uh, in the run-up to the right. election. But do you know what? There are many uh, people who have essentially legal blood on their hands at this point. It was a Conservative yep. government at yep. this time, and then there was a Labour government previously. People are saying, well, Sir Keir Starmer, as a public prosecutor, the CPS did actually prosecute some sub postmasters themselves. What did he know? Why didn't he do anything about it? Wait a second, wait a second. The, the CPS is... doesn't prosecute. The post office doesn't need the CPS. No, but they did actually do some themselves. Right. But, um, but basically, what it seems to me what's happened is, for years, everybody in the establishment completely ignored this. They just thought, oh, well, doesn't matter, just a few sub postmasters. They probably had the hand right. in the till anyway, because they don't listen to real people. They hold real people in disdain. And then all of a sudden, when an ITV drama is made and the public go, hang on a minute, I really empathise with this because I feel like there's something very wrong in society. Politicians all scramble like, oh, no, 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 it's just terrible, oh, oh, when they ignored it for years and then think, oh, but hold on, there's an election coming up. I might use this to hit my opponents over the head. Yeah. No, represent people. Yeah. Stand up for everyday people. This isn't a political game. This is a, Someone, a horrible Someone somewhere scandal. at the post office knew 
And I think a collection of people knew that what they were doing was throwing these poor sub-postmasters and sub-mistresses to the wolves in order to protect the reputation of the post office. And no, 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 it's not our lousy computer system. It's these people. They've got their fingers in the till. 736? That's ridiculous. That's yeah. ridiculous. Someone's going to take the blame for this, and it'll be more than one person. Uh, Paula Venels, the chief, chief executive of the post office at the time, uh, big calls, a uh, petition of more than a million to have her stripped of her CBE. I think we all agree with that. Uh, but I think if she gets away with just uh, losing her CBE, she's going to be very, very lucky. I think she's got to have her collar felt and the police have got to talk to her. Yeah, but this is... We were talking about this, weren't we, before coming on air, that there is something very wrong when you can just perpetually fail, when you can be the cause of misery for lots of people, whether you are a banking chief, when ordinary people have no access to bank accounts because they've been debanked on account of voting a certain way or holding a certain viewpoint and these people just get golden handshakes yeah. and move on to the next job and you were saying weren't you if you've gone to the right school if you did the right thing at university if you had dinner parties with the right, the right set, people you, if you know the, the right, right people if you've earned the right amount of money by a certain point in your yeah. career then you are untouchable it will never be you and it will just, always be the and you'll just man. move from sinecure to sinecure. Or oh, you could yeah. be a director of this, you could be, you know, governor of this, and so on and so forth. Uh, let's yeah. quickly have a look at uh, the legendary current business minister setting out the government response uh, to the post office scandal. He is, of course, the household name Kevin Hollinrake. Take it away, Kev. Getting justice for the victims of this scandal and ensuring that such a tragedy can never happen again is my highest priority as a minister and has been throughout my 15 months in office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When we talk about compensation, we have to remember that the lives of postmasters and their families caught up in this scandal have been changed forever. They have faced financial ruin, untold personal distress and a loss of reputation that no amount of financial compensation can fully restore. The government recognises, however, that we have a clear moral duty to right these wrongs to the best of our ability. To support those lives who were turned upside down by this scandal, we have provided significant funding for compensation. Uh, charisma goes a long I way know. in politics. <laughs> now, uh, uh, post office hero Alan Bates, Mr. Bates. Now that's a man who actually office. should be knighted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he has been given a free holiday uh, by Richard Branson in a PR bid by the Virgin boss. Uh, he'll be cropping up in our review in just a little mm -hmm. while. Uh, let's have a look at uh, Mr. Bates receiving that holiday. There is some good news. Now, in an interview uh, with the Sunday mm. Times, you said, if Richard Branson is reading this, I'd love a holiday. Uh, well, we were one of the very few people to get in touch with Sir Richard um, and Virgin yesterday, and he has sent you the following. Uh, Dear Alan, I did get a chance to read your moving interview in the Times, and we'd love to offer you and Suzanne a well-earned holiday on Necker Island. Mm. I can't think of anyone who deserves a break more. Hopefully, see you there. Best, Richard. Thank you very much, Richard. <laughs> much appreciated. Much needed, Lovely. but very much beaten. Necker oh. Oiland, eh? Necker Oiland. Ne Necker Oiland. Like uh, like uh, we're going to be asking telly. later on, by the way, on Crosstalk, why is Fujitsu, the Japanese tech giant, this that is created ridiculous. this appalling computer system, Horizon, why is it still winning? Over the past few years, it's won, uh, I think it's at £6.7 billion pounds worth right. of government contracts. Yeah, it's still getting government contracts. 200 why? contracts, why? which is absolutely mad. Well, we'll, we'll be delving into that on Crosstalk at one o'clock. Now, uh, we need to go back to the Epstein files, Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, new sensational allegations today that mm. uh, his various alleged friends, uh, Prince Andrew, Richard Branson oh, yeah. and Bill Clinton, were filmed. This is These are allegations that all involved deny were filmed uh, having sex with Epstein's girls. Uh, if that is true... Uh, that is a bombshell development. Right. Uh, this is Sarah Ransom. She gave a victim impact statement ahead of the sentencing of Ghislaine Maxwell. And she has said previously that uh, Epstein had managed to get on camera, get on videotape, uh, Clinton, Prince Andrew and Branson all having sexual intercourse uh, without him appearing in the footage himself. She then later went on in an interview to say, oh, well, I kind of made it up. I only said it so the media uh, would be interested yeah. in the story. And now she's sort of 
sort of turn around and said, but then I made up that I made it up. So I don't really know <laughs> what is going on and who's telling the truth here. But certainly if some sort of, uh, you know, motion video exists of this, that changes the game entirely. No wonder Richard Branson's given Richard out Branson free Richard Branson has vehemently denied this. And we know that Bill Clinton and Prince Andrew, of course, also deny these charges. But uh, the allegations spilling out of the Epstein tapes are causing ructions like never before. Uh, meanwhile, uh, in the in the files as well, uh, one of Andrew's lawyers denied that he could have. He was accused of having sex with Virginia Roberts, as she was then, uh, in 2001 in Ghislaine Maxwell's London Muse House. And uh, the one of the defence mechanisms that they were working out here's the picture at uh, that that flash. By the way, is the camera and Jeffrey Epstein's taking the picture. Uh, now, one of their defence mechanisms was to say that Prince Andrew could pos not possibly have had sex in that bath because he's too big. Well, uh, <laughs> years ago, as I said, yes, R.I.P. the News of the World, the News oh. of the World newspaper, uh, they uh, sort of stunted it all up and they proved actually he could have had sex in that bath. It's the more noble. So that arm. doesn't work. It's the more noble <laughs> arm of journalism yeah. when. Uh, hacks, I wish I was on that. Investigative journalism. But yeah. given it's only 9.40 in the morning, I don't think we can really talk about the logistics of frolicking within we bathtubs in detail. We just did. We just did. In uh, detail. We ju in detail. Well, in I don't detail. want to talk about it in detail ever. Um, <laughs> now, uh, Britain's richest woman, I don't know what you earned last year. Uh, it wasn't uh, that uh, much. <laughs> or what I earned, but uh, uh, Denise Coates, the founder and chief executive of Bet365, uh, she earned £271 million. Pounds. It's absolutely bonkers isn't it? It actually works out. If you base this on working days, it actually works out more than a million pounds yeah, every day you years. turn up to work. Yeah. But what I find so awful about this, look, private sector is free to pay people whatever they want as long as they're taxed on it as they should be. But what, is, what always sticks in my core is the fact that the people who pocket the biggest sums of money are usually in charge of some of the most awful and scrupulous industries. And we all know that the gambling industry fundamentally is pretty evil. The online gambling, people People with addictions. I once did a special program on this, and I was horrified. Horrified yeah, but we don't, by, let, let, let's by be the careful statistics. Here. We don't know that Denise Coates. Uh, I didn't is say up that. I said the gambling industry is pretty callous. But she's a, she's an impressive woman. She formed this company. Uh, and they used to work, used to uh, run it out of her back garden shed. Now it is one of the most massive companies in the world, and uh, she rewards herself rather handsomely. Uh, she's a billionaire. She received a salary of twenty. £221 million pounds, uh, last year and uh, she got a £50 million pound bonus or various other dividends. She's earned £1.2 billion over the past four years. As you say, Alex, if you work that out, she's been making over... What, every time she turns up to work, right, you go to work in the morning, you get there at 9 o'clock, leave at 5, whatever. Uh, if you're Denise Coates, you go to work at 9 in the morning, you leave at 5, you just earn a million quid. A million quid in a day. Well, apparently the group also made a £105 million pound donation to the Denise Coates Foundation, a registered charity. Well, I hope that goes some way into helping people who are the victims of gambling addiction. And she also uh, funded uh, Stoke City's appalling stadium, which is about 800 miles outside of Stoke. You'd never get back into the city. Uh, next time you want to build a stadium uh, for a football club, maybe put it in the city that it represents. But there you go. That's just a side issue. Uh, Pope Francis. Now, surrogacy. Surrogacy. Uh, you know, this is the system by which women who are unable to uh, have children, they uh, use a, a friend sometimes sometimes, sometimes uh, just somebody they're introduced to, to surrogate, uh, to have a surrogate pregnancy and they get the joy of having their child. And uh, Pope Francis uh, has called for a ban on this, uh, presumably because uh, people get too much joy from it. Now, do you know what? I'm actually I'm not going to defend him calling it a despicable practice. It's not a despicable but practice. I actually think there are there, there is a moral case to be made for and against this. And actually, what I would say is, you know, this is supposed to be in the Catholic world, the representative of God on earth, and at least somebody is doing something to realise the Bible exists more so than the Church of England, which has just gone ridiculously woke. He calls it despicable, which I think is a bit much. But he does point out that in some countries, what happens is people are women who are very poor are essentially being used as a uterus for rent, and it's rather um, distasteful in certain 
certain situations. I mean, personally, I don't know whether it's right for uh, a gay couple who couldn't naturally conceive to create a child using a do donor egg and then using, you know, Freedom. another woman as the oven. Why not? Uh, Why because not? there are plenty of children out Why there not? who need to be adopted. But and I think that sort of, you know, yeah, you, can't, bringing... you can't ban people from this no, if they I, want well, to do, do this. You know what? Do you know what? On some level, I'm against it, and I probably would. I no, would. no, no. But I do think there's Rules, a big difference. Rules, regulations, stick them where the sun don't shine. If you want to have a surrogate child, you should be able to have a surrogate child. It's nothing to do with the Pope, and it's not a despicable well, the Pope practice. Well, gets to have an opinion on religion, doesn't practice. he? That's his job. Yeah. And at least he's doing it a bit better yeah. than Justin Welby. Yeah, how's that contraception that thing going, exists. Popey? Uh, any good? Although uh, he does say, by the way, he doesn't like gender theory, so go on, Pope. I agree with you on that one. Okay, yeah, but he, uh, he trust me, he won't go too far down that road. Uh, but I just think people should be able to do what they like if they want to have a kid. Uh, right, uh, nurses and midwives, uh, <laughs> you'll like this one, face being struck off for intentionally misgendering patients. Uh, 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 the guidelines from the Nursing and Midwifery Council uh, tell medics how they can express their beliefs appropriately uh, and when they risk, run the risk of a sanction. So if somebody comes in and says, you know, I'm, I'm a, a woman and, uh, you know, they're clearly not, uh, if nurses and midwives say, well, you're, you're actually a bloke, uh, it looks like they could be struck off for you that. Would, well, really? You would <laughs> hope that the people who would know most about uh, biological sex and, you know, genitals and things like that would be the very people delivering babies, you know, that they should understand how the birds and the bees and basic biology works. But no, in the world of woke, that, you know, if someone comes in with a massive beard and says, oh, actually, I'm a woman, you go, yes, you are. No, you're not. But, but misgendering cannot be a crime. It cannot be punishable by dismissal or being struck off or some kind of legal case against you. Look, uh, as I always say, if you're a trans woman or a trans man, you want me to call you she, I will call you she because I want you to be happy. Uh, but uh, if I don't want to call you she, that's a question of freedom of speech. If I want to say you're a bloke, I should be allowed to do it. I don't approve of that. I think it's rude and nasty. But if you want to do it, why not? I just think when you're in the middle of giving birth, the last thing you'd probably worry about is your pronoun. And also, I'm sorry, <laughs> what a wonky world we're living in when babies are being brought into this world, when the father's the mother and the mother's the father and it's all born out of a surrogate. I'm sorry, call me traditional, call me evil if you like, but I'm not sure that this is all a good idea. Well, as I say, I'm for freedom of the individual. If people want to do all this, they should be allowed to do it. Andrew Tate, oh. the controversial influencer, uh, he is beginning to win his case in Romania, uh, where he faces his charges of human tra trafficking and rape, uh, but he's been seeking uh, the return of his assets, millions of pounds worth of assets, loads of luxury cars, along with his brother Tristan, and they've won that case. They've started to uh, win their appeal against uh, these very serious charges. Oh, do you know what? I hope that he comes out of jail, is walking about in Bucharest, and the father of one of his victims comes along and biffs him over the head because I just think he's an utterly disgusting, deplorable character, yet another horrible symptom of the 21st century. Uh, evidence that we are now in a, a, a maelstrom of horror, quite, quite frankly, moral horror. Right, so um, but, you know, get your car back, whatever, I don't care. Just car, leave, cars. Get, just, 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 just leave the internet. By the way, by the way, uh, you oblivion, heard this hit here last. He's nowhere creature. near as rich as he pretends he is. He's a Joey Barton, the footballer, Another claims creature. his relentless tirade against women football is, uh, this is extraordinary, a duty to his great-grandfather uh, who fought in the First World War uh, and uh, therefore he seems to think that's OK to say women football, football as a kind of idiots. <laughs> Do you know, I kind of think, you know, on one hand, if Joey Barton says these women have got these jobs for the sake of box ticking and aren't very good at it, that doesn't help anybody. I believe in meritocracy. I also think if he doesn't like particular commentators or pundits, fine, he can have that opinion. But he doesn't exactly deliver his opinion in a sensible and balanced way, does he? Yeah, well, and, uh, you know, now to sort of say he's doing it in the memory of someone who died in the, you know, the First World yeah, War, what, what has that got to do with what anything? He said. Listen to what he said. What he said. This is to justify the fact he keeps telling them, saying that women's football is rubbish, women's footballers sleep their way to the top, uh, compared, all this nonsense. He compared the pundits yeah, to yeah, Fred and Rose Yeah, West. but listen, listen to this. I have a great-grandfather who was gassed at Ypres in 1915. He received a military medal for bravery later in that war. Patrick Stanton is his name. Look up his citation if you choose. What's that got to do with it? What on earth has that got to do with it? Uh, respect to uh, Joey's great-grandfather, but as as an excuse for his war on female football. I just don't get it. Uh, now, Channel 4. 
Channel 4, uh, which mainly makes programmes about people without any clothes on, obsessed <laughs> with nudity. Yeah, they and are. it makes lots and lots of programmes that absolutely no one wants to watch. The management there don't seem to have any idea what uh, British people want to watch on telly. Uh, they've announced these job cuts uh, and they've uh, axed two programmes, SAS. Uh, who Dares Wins. Now, that used to be popular, but they wokeified it. It went all woke and then people stopped watching it. Uh, and uh, the other programme that they claim to be popular that's been axed is Steph's Back Lunch, which uh, I think once got an audience of about 12, used to struggle to get into double figures, its audience. That was never popular. So saying we've had to axe popular Steph's Pack Lunch uh, is a bit of a stretch. But what this is all about is a television industry in turmoil. Uh, we're at the kind of linchpin, the turning point, where old-school terrestrial television is struggling. Uh, Channel 4 says it's going to go straight to digital. Uh, so they're in a period of flux. Uh, but what Channel 4 needs to learn is how to make programmes that people actually want to watch. And uh, I've got a message for the uh, people who run Channel 4. Just getting people to take their clothes off isn't necessarily all that entertaining. So how about a few less programmes about nudity and nakedness? Meanwhile, at Channel 4, uh, uh, Alex, I'll get your view on this. There's a diversity round. They've appointed five new directors, you know, these sinecures mm -hmm. that the establishment hand out, around, as we were talking about uh, earlier, that they hand out among themselves. And four of them are white and middle-aged, and uh, this apparently is a scandal. Well, what's quite interesting about this is they themselves didn't appoint the board members. I think these appointments were made by Ofcom and Channel 4 themselves have launched a protest against oh, the appointment okay, that wrong, of these I? four white directors. Take it back. It says it has ethnic diversity targets. But uh, basically, Channel 4's board now has 15 members of who 14 or 93% are white. I'm pretty sure if you looked up the demographics of this country, that's pretty reflective of it. Yeah, so that's what I don't understand about this. Also, I actually think that I don't know the exact figures. I'll Google them after the show. But I'm sure that something like the white population makes around maybe even as high as 95%. I'm not sure. So 93% being white. Oh. Is that really a gross misrepresentation of society? Also, who cares about what colour someone's skin is? Are you good at your exactly. job? Exactly. Frankly, it is racist to start giving people jobs or denying Jeez. people jobs based upon their skin colour. Right, right, Can right, you right. do it? And are you good at it? That's all that Yeah, matters. Yeah, and if you look at these four white people who have controversially been appointed to the Channel 4 uh, board, look at them. Look at their qualifications. They are eminent qualified to be on the board of a, a uh, television channel that has no idea what it's doing. They might help it but out of its problems. But wants them sacked because they're right. white. Yes, exactly. Now, Meghan Markle, uh, she didn't uh, join her friends, her <laughs> former co-stars of the uh, little-known oh. uh, cable show Suits, the My legal God. drama at the 81st wow. Golden Globe Awards on Sunday, uh, because wow. stars her co-stars Patrick Adams, and Gabriel Macht, uh, Sarah Rafferty and Gina Torres said they didn't have her phone number. Yeah, so they were there to <laughs> present... The cast of Suits were there to present the award to Succession, I think, for winning yes. some telly thing on in, in that award ceremony. And so they all turned up and Meghan Markle wasn't there. They said, oh, yeah, well, we don't know how to get in touch with her. She's like, really? You don't? Um, but then, of course, a source close to Meghan Markle said, oh, well, you know, she was invited, but she had prior commitments. Every single time they've been dropped from something, the line from the source close to them is yeah. that they've got such a busy diary, not that they've been seen for about two months, that, uh, you know, they, they were invited but just couldn't turn up. Right, let's, really? have, uh, let's move on to the snow. Uh, I oh, mean, it snowed a bit yesterday For many of uh, us, uh, we expected big blankets of snow, certainly down here in London, and it didn't really happen, but around the country, I think... Uh, uh, a lot of people did get very snowbound. Here you go. A Kent, uh, not far from London, was uh, heavily uh, bar bombarded by snowflakes. So uh, we are expecting, because it's freezing, uh, that uh, this could oh, get worse. Pretty. This is exactly what we didn't see in London. Bombardment. <laughs> I mean, I know this, this causes chaos, but it is good to look at. There was, you know, I walked home after cross talk yesterday. I've got my trainers on and I thought I'm going to walk home. New year, new me and all that. And um, it was like flowing around a bit like being in a snow globe. It just wasn't really settling. But it did make my walk quite pleasant. I don't mind a bit of the white stuff. It cheers me up. Yeah, well, makes winter yeah. more bearable. It was bearable. so cold last night I had to go to a Greek restaurant and drink 16 bottles of Red Sea. Yeah, so I, 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 I got stuck a into treat. a I wasn't feeling anything pain after that. Oh, uh, listen, uh, I'm not sure how much this means to you. It means quite a lot to me and lots of sports fans. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yesterday was the end of an era. It's, 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 isn't it extraordinary the way 
you get a, a very significant death in a, one area, say sport, and then immediately after you get another one. So the people who died yesterday uh, were, were Franz Beckenbauer, the German footballing legend. I would apologise for that. I do not know him. No, Never no, no. He's a him, fantastic. I'm sure he was a great well, he man. played in the '66 final. I wasn't around. Uh, and uh, he became a manager, uh, an ambassador for the sport. Brilliant. Brilliant player. He died aged 78. And then uh, J.P.R. Williams, the Welsh le rugby legend, famous for his massive sideboards, he died uh, aged 74 after a battle with meningitis. So Ooh, he was cut down uh, in uh, late, late, late in life. Yeah, my mum messaged me about J.P.R. I'm a big rugby fan coming from Gloucester, so his is a name I do know. But yeah. I hope they rest Great and, player. Uh, he was a fullback. And, and, in, and enjoy playing brilliant games of football and rugby in heaven. I think he was, I think he was the greatest the rugby fullback of all time. Uh, now, uh, you love this story. I'm, begin I'm warming to it. Peregrine <laughs> One, the oh useless space gosh. rocket that's allegedly <laughs> making its way to the moon. Uh, yeah. Basically, its solar panels have gone wrong. Took off yesterday, of course. There we are. Doomed moon trip. Took off yesterday, uh, and then its solar panels went wrong, which is powering it, so it doesn't look like it will make it to the moon yeah. at all, which is bad news for <laughs> uh, Star Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry, his wife Majel Barrett, uh, also DeForest Kelly, the actor who played uh, Leonard Bones McCoy, and Nichelle Nichols, uh, Lieutenant Uhura, of course, and James du Duhan Scotty, the original crew, they all had their ashes in this rocket. And this, the module apparently was supposed to go around the sun forever. Uh, also would, on board were DNA hair sample, samples this is just from so weird. US President George Washington Dwight. Eisenhower and John F. Kennedy. Why? Why are they on board? However, they're never going to make it. There's, I understand one thing, which is people paying up to $13,000 to have ashes scattered on the moon. I can understand because then, you know, future generations will look up and go, that was great granddad up on the moon there. I think that's kind of romantic and nice. But the hair samples of former US presidents, that's kind of a bit weird. Like, what's going on there? I, I... But anyway, it's not going to get to the moon, sadly. Uh, just going to be uh, in, 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 in infinity and beyond. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I suppose, I suppose the Star Trek mob will just, like, explode in the middle of space. Uh, but very strange, very strange that uh, DNA samples of George Washington, Dwight Eisenhower and JFK are up there in this just rocket gonna, that isn't going to make it to the moon. It has to space just floating around the hair of old US yeah, presidents yeah, yeah. somewhere Doomed up there in the sky. Project. Extraordinary, yeah. extraordinary. What a story. Uh, we'll be looking... Uh, at that later in the day. Now, uh, sadly, of course, Alex, we've come to the end of the show. Thank you for tuning in. Do join us a bit later for our other show. You know what it is. Cross Talk. Talk. That comes up at 1pm, though. Next is Juliet Hartley Brewer, so do stay tuned. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, 